Border outpost. Got nothing to trade, you got no business in Barton Town. Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 101 and 102, which begin with more of Enola's swimming lesson, and end with the Mariner scooping an oily substance from the water. The slow motion shot that we ended with last week continues into this week's clip, and it is more swimming around. We get shots above the water and below the water and they're swimming around practicing different strokes and things like that it's a swimming lesson what can i say i do want to make a quick note about the lighting it's clearly sunset not sunrise so (laughs) so what you're saying is that this scene should have happened after the meal scene yes before the nighttime scene yes exactly if we mention it once a week Eventually, it'll just magically, it'll just magically rearrange happen. itself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just more support than it really should have been the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to focus in on the swim lesson first, or do you want to focus in on Helen first? Let's focus in on Helen first, and then we can get into the swimming itself. Okay. Because Helen, as she's watching all of this happen... We get a lot of close-ups on her, and we are looking at her, looking at Enola, looking at the Mariner, and it seems to me that Helen is beginning to see the Mariner in a new light. This is a side of the Mariner that she has not seen before, a side that has the ability to be patient, to be helpful, and do something a bit selfless. And I can't help but bet that she's thinking, oh, he's not such a bad guy after all. He's got a soft spot. I bet I can change him. Oh, gross. Yeah, I feel gross about this whole thing, about this (laughs) whole way she's looking at him. Ew. And this is so tropey. The man with a child scene. And it just occurred to me where we have seen this trope recently. Recently to us in January 2021. It's in Bridgerton, the Netflix show Bridgerton Regency era drama, where the, at that point in time, fiance troubled relationship, to say the least, comes over for a family meal. Mm -hmm. And there's young Bridgertons around and he sits down with them. He's playing with them. It's wonderful. And Daphne does this exact same thing. It's so gross. Like, oh, maybe I can change him. Maybe I can make this work because he's so good with children. In Bridgerton, he's made it clear in the past he doesn't want to have children because he has a grudge against his dead dad. It's this whole thing. Go on Netflix and watch it. You'll get a good understanding of what I'm talking about. But Daphne, the main character of that show, thinks, oh, I can sway him. I can bring him around to a different way of thinking. Same with Helen. She knows that the Mariner does not like people. He prefers to be alone. Oh, but look at him with Enola. Maybe he can change. Maybe we can be a family, just like in that drawing that magically transformed in the middle of a conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've heard Bridgerton described as Pride and Prejudice meets Gossip Girl. And having not seen Gossip Girl, I'll say, yeah, sure, whatever. (laughs) I haven't seen Gossip Girl either. Yeah. I saw all of Bridgerton, though, so there's that. Maybe you don't need to see Gossip Girl now. I guess so. But it's interesting to see Helen coming to this, I don't want to say realization, but concocting this image in her head that I'm sure she's dreaming up and thinking forward to the scene after the trading post that we're going to get to in weeks ahead where she is once again forming an idea in her head of how things are going to be and she is going to once again be upset when her idea of how things are going to be does not line up 
with how things actually are. Not that she's necessarily setting herself up to fail, but I definitely feel like she's setting herself up for disappointment. Yeah, and I would think that her life has taught her not to do that. This is a difficult life in this particular post-apocalyptic setting. Nobody has an easy life here. Everybody doesn't get what they want. Everybody faces hardship and near-death experiences and hunger. And this is just life now. So where does she get off being so freaking hopeful? Where does she get off? (laughs) Where does this come from? Looking forward to the future like a sap. Like having high expectations of people? Really? Are we so... Really? Are we so jaded and cynical that we see someone having hope for the future or trying to see the good in another person and we mock them? Yes. (laughs) Yes, because she is supposed to be jaded. (laughs) Yeah, but so many of the people in charge of the atoll were jaded and we hate those people. Yeah, well, they're dead now. That's true. Most of them are dead now. So they had reason to not get their hopes up. (laughs) And we also know something that Helen doesn't know is that she shouldn't be getting her hopes up either. She is only going to be disappointed and then eventually not disappointed, but that's a whole nother. Oh, Helen gets hers. Alternate ending. That's true. Helen gets hers. (laughs) It's just so blatant. The way that they filmed this and edited it, that's a really hard word to say, that She is supposed to be falling for him right now. And it's just so gross. Yeah. She had one decent conversation with him. Everything else has been abusive. And she's falling for him. Yep. And you know what that tells me? Is that she is in an abusive relationship with him. That he is in control and he has the ability to either abuse her or pretend like everything's okay. And it's working. Is on this her. Stockholm syndrome? It is working on her. So, yes, it just might be. Because everybody always talks about, oh, Beauty and the Beast. Belle was having Stockholm syndrome for the Beast. But no, I think this might actually be Stockholm syndrome. She's right. been with the Mariner for so long that she's falling for him just because of proximity. That just might be. I mean, there's that saying, there are plenty of fish in the sea, but... There's only one fish on a boat. Yeah. <laughs> He's literally a fish in this situation. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, and, boy. And also, there is legitimately something to be said for single moms out there dating. When you meet a man who jives with your child, that's points. That's legitimately points because there's so many men out there who are not going to jive with your child. And no matter how much you like that man, if he's not interested in being at least some level of stepdad, are you going to continue that relationship? Should you continue that relationship? I am not one to answer that question, but it's definitely points if they're into it. (laughs) So... This scene, it's so much easier to look at Enola and see how freaking happy she is. I paused it on an image where she is looking back at Helen with the biggest smile on her face. We have not seen Enola be this happy. She's a relatively happy child. She is not traumatized by her past, which is questionable, but whatever. Yeah, it's weird. But she is so happy in this moment. And that happiness is attractive to Helen, and it should be attractive to Helen. Like, oh, what is this thing, this activity, this person, this situation that is making my child so happy? What can I do to make it keep happening? Mm -hmm. Julia's sister is a lifeguard and a swim instructor and just a million different jobs in and around the pools that she works at. And so we called her up and we asked her to record a little snippet for the podcast here that we could drop into this episode. And so this is a professional's assessment of this scene. Hey, everybody. This is Christina. I'm Julia's sister. I'm a swim instructor, and I have been for a really long time. I love the water. I love to swim. And I've got some thoughts about this scene. My first big concern was safety. They're out here in the ocean. You know, even experienced and strong swimmers can have something happen to them where they 
need assistance. And I was worried that there wasn't any, but I did learn from asking Julia that the woman, Helen, does know how to swim. Hopefully she was willing to lend a hand if something unexpected happened and they needed some help in the water. So there we go. Hopefully they were being really safe. My second thought was that we probably missed the really dramatic part of this swim lesson. It takes trust to teach a kid how to swim. And from what I understand, I didn't watch the movie, so I had to ask a few questions. But from what I understand, it sounds like this little girl did not fully trust the mariner. So there were probably some growing pains as they started to get this lesson going. She probably screamed and cried and said he was unfair and that she hated him. And he probably got angry at her and said, just do it. But by the time we come into this one lesson, it appears to be going pretty smoothly. She looks like she's having fun and she's pretty comfortable in the water. Maybe she's a natural born swimmer. But I think we missed some of the waterworks. There's some dramatic stuff happening at the beginning. And as far as technique goes, obviously, like she's not going to the Olympics with what she knows now. But I did see that she knows how to tread water and she knows how to propel herself forward. And those are great safety skills to have the very basic. If she fell off that boat, she could take care of herself for a few minutes while she waited for someone to rescue her. And that's really important. So, yeah, those are my thoughts on this scene from the movie. And uh, thanks for listening. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. (laughs) (laughs) Big thank you to Christina for recording that clip for us. Christina brought up something that I didn't even consider for this scene. The initial leap from the boat into the water that we didn't get to see Enola take. Yeah, how did this all get started? Whose idea was it? The Mariner that we know, I can picture him just throwing her in like he did before and then jumping in after her and being like, no, no, I'm not going to rescue you. I'm going to teach you how to swim. I can picture that based on the Mariner that we have seen in the past. Mm Mm-hmm. I can also picture Nola just really being on board for all of this. I've said before, she is happy. She is willing. She's enthusiastic about things. So I can also see it that she asked to be taught how to swim and voluntarily got in the water. I could see the Mariner, once Helen goes to take a nap after the meal, standing up and saying, so you want to know how to swim? And Enola would have been like, uh, yeah. That's what I've been saying. And then he would have said, okay, let's go. And then he would jump off the boat into the water. And then I'm sure there would be a little bit of hesitation on Enola's part. But I also see her fully trusting the Mariner because that's just how she is. And jumping right into the water. Yeah, she has absolutely no reason to trust him. But I don't doubt that she does because she's dumb. It's just stupid. Yes, he has this special swimming ability. But he's also been abusive to her and Helen in the past. He does not deserve your immediate trust. But she's, you know, 10. (laughs) Christina said, hey, she's got these couple of techniques. She can tread water. She can propel herself forward. And it's not going to take her to the Olympics. But it's going to keep her safe if she fell overboard until somebody could get to her. Now, we saw that exact situation. She fell overboard and was then rescued by Helen. She was fine in the, I don't know how long it took Helen to get out there, but long enough that she could have drowned. The flailing that she was doing was enough to keep her somewhat above water. Yeah, so I'm not really sure that she didn't already have these skills that she gained here today. Yeah, I suspect that everybody on Waterworld is a natural born swimmer because even if you were not taught how to swim yourself, you've seen other people swim And so you at least understand the theory behind the thing. I've seen people drive stick shift race cars and things to that effect. I've watched a lot of Top Gear and Grand Tour. Yeah. But if you put me behind the wheel of a high-end sports car and say, all right, you're going to do a lap, it will not end well. I will ruin that car, I am sure. I know the theory, but I do not know the practice. And so it makes sense to me that Enola would pick this stuff up quickly. That's a good point. It was like me learning to ride the motorcycle. The theory behind riding a motorcycle is exactly the same as driving a manual. It's the same transmission. It's just a different muscle memory. Mm -hmm. Everything's done with different limbs. So it was hard for me to switch around that muscle memory, but 
I already had the principles in my head. I already knew what was happening when I pulled in the clutch, when I upshifted, when I downshifted. That stuff was already in my head. I just had to reapply it to the motorcycle, which was very difficult and one of the reasons I do not ride. In a pinch, I might be able to get a motorcycle going, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at the clips of the swim lesson, it's clear to me that the Mariner teaches Enola how to freestyle. That is the stroke that she's doing as she's swimming around him. He's got his hand out in front of her, and she is doing that arm over arm movement mm -hmm. with her legs kicking out the back. And at the end of that, he pulls his hands away, and she's able to tread water to stay above the surface. Yeah. Something I do like about these clips is that there are moments of legit swim teaching. And then there's moments where they're just goofing around, having fun. So like when he's holding her up, like he's giving her an opportunity to learn proper kicking and using her arms to keep her head above water. Yeah. Stuff that is actually useful. After that, you see she's treading water on the surface. He's swimming around her and showing her how he moves so that she can emulate it. And then, of course, you have the shot of him breaching the surface of the water, and that's just goofing around between the two of them yeah and you're right enola looks extremely happy in this situation and that happiness carries over mm -hmm. the next scene we get they're kind of back to normal all three of them on the boat the boat is purposefully moving forward and she still has this post swim lesson glow yeah her smile is still huge she Feels more comfortable on the boat. You can tell. She feels more comfortable on the boat because she feels more comfortable with the Mariner. Mm -hmm. And they are sailing towards this tall structure sticking up out of the water. And it's a bit of a funny looking thing because it is so tall and the base is so small. Yes, it looks so funky. The structure that we're looking at, it is essentially a trading barge. The Mariner describes it as a barter outpost. Here's how it's described in the book. The spire-shaped tower jutted from the horizon like a massive deformed tree, as if metal and wood fragments had grown together somehow. A chimney spiraled black smoke into the clear sky, while much smaller box-like structures, attached by lines, bobbed around the much larger one like buoys. Viewing this through binoculars, Helen frowned. Too small for an atoll, what was this place? What was this nightmarish tower? Out on the prow, the child was squinting at the spire, looming two kilometers ahead. Then her question echoed Helen's thoughts. What is it? Helen, standing near the mariner in the cockpit, looked at the trimoran's captain, even as a cold suspicion began crawling up her spine. Barter outpost, he said casually, not looking at her. You said we'd get to dry land today. She tried not to put too much accusation in the words. Today, tomorrow, what's it matter? She winced. What's it matter? I need canvas. We have canvas, Helen said. We got canvas off that drifter's boat. But he didn't reply. Something wasn't right. She was about to question him more pointedly when she noticed that his expression seemed troubled as well. Shedding its jib, the trimaran began bearing in on the tower, but 100 meters out, the mariner suddenly changed his mind. We don't get in the book what happens here in the movie where the Mariner is shouting out to the occupants of this tower, and the specific reason for wanting to stop here he gives is different, saying that he wants resin as opposed to sailcloth. I'd like that he mentions resin here because it does seem to be his eternal goal over the course of this movie. He needs resin. He needed resin with the first drifter. He asked about resin at the atoll. He asked about resin with the second drifter, and here at the barter outpost, he is asking, yet again, for resin. He's just a man who wants resin. Yep. Nothing if not consistent. <laughs> and we get the return of Portu Greek, where he shouts about repairs and asking if they'll trade. He labels the Portu Greek as their own language. And earlier, months ago, we talked about it being the language of the traders. Mm -hmm. So... The way it's presented to us in the movie as a barter outpost, that makes a lot of sense. This is where the language comes from, is the language of bartering. But there is a much darker side to this whole thing that the movie skims over, sort of. Mm. Sort of skims over. 
what we can see of the barter outpost in the very lowest level to the ground, there are people with their arms pulled up above their heads. And that's not normal. That's not normal. These are captives. These are slaves. Yeah. And it's not spoken of in the movie, but that's what's happening here is when they say barter outpost, they mean people barter yeah. outpost. There are sudden realizations that were mentioned in the passage that I read. Yes. That we're not going to necessarily see until next week. But the groundwork is being laid as we look at this, as the Mariner shouts out, something is not right. They're not responding in a way that he's necessarily used to. Right. And like most things in this movie, there is a video from the Atoll YouTube page specifically talking about this structure that I would highly recommend going out and watching. I'll definitely post a link in the listener page. But this structure, it looks so odd and so haphazard. And I love how it has such an ominous description in the book because it's sort of off kilter. Doesn't exactly seem like the most balanced thing as far as structures go. And that aligns with the feeling that the Mariner has about something just being off. Mm -hmm. It helps to communicate that off feeling to us that it is literally off its center of gravity. Behind the scenes... This structure was built on a large deep sea navigation buoy. It was about 12 feet tall below the waterline with additional structures on top. So the fact that they were able to weld a 35 foot high beam to the center of it and build a structure off of that is rather remarkable. And they gave it added stability by adding additional structures below the waterline. But at the end of the day, this whole thing is just floating on a buoy. It's free floating, and it's not attached to the ocean floor or anything like that. It's just floating there. And it's remarkable that they can get something so big and actually put it out to sea. Yeah, production-wise, it was fantastic. Again, highly recommend the Atoll video. He goes into its construction and all that stuff, and it was fascinating. In Waterworld... It's genius to use these buoys because they're all over the place. They're all over the world. Mm -hmm. And in their society, most likely they don't mean anything anymore. Everything seems to be pretty much a free for all. So they're just up for grabs and they are incredibly useful. I wouldn't be surprised if there was at least one of these under the atoll. Mm -hmm. I always wondered how they did this, made something so tall and yet so stable. And it's because there is so much structure below the surface. It's not quite like an iceberg because there is more above than below, but it's similar to an iceberg where Mm. there is just a lot that you don't see that is supporting what you do see. I can't imagine what life on this sort of barter outpost would be like because it seems very exposed. It seems very small. There's... A good amount of structure to it, but at the same time, it's your base platform with a little jetty sticking out of it. It's got a main floor and then a floor above that, and then it's a tented ceiling. There's very little in terms of creature comforts, and it was described in the book as having smaller buoys surrounding it. Those don't exist in the movie at all. Yeah, so this is an outpost for trading slaves. I'm willing to bet that the people running it are also not necessarily slaves, but also not full-fledged members of society. Yeah. That they are somewhere in between. We've talked before. We see smokers. We see atollers. Where are the slavers? I think these are the slavers. These are the guys that are making good quality resin these days, as described by the first drifter way back in the opening minutes of the movie. Right. Now, Although they said it was a good grade epoxy. But it's the same yeah. thing. Remind me, if we talked about this, that I got the vibe that they were making the epoxy out of people? I mean, we did talk about that. Okay. I couldn't really remember, but I was just reminded of that now. But then again, that was also months ago. That was a very long time ago. <laughs> the Mariner looks down and he sees a slick of oil on the surface of the water drifting past the nets. And so he reaches down through the netting 
scoops up that oil slick and holds it to his nose, I guess to confirm that it actually is oil because apparently there are so many different substances that behave exactly like oil on the water. And he says out loud, that's what I thought. So he's already getting inklings that something is wrong. Yeah, he's starting to put together the pieces of his intuition into something actionable. Yeah, but here at the end of the clip, we're left in suspense, waiting to see what happens in the next episode. So on that note, we're going to put a pin in things. Come back next time. You will see Helen realize that something is amiss. The Mariner will discover smokers lying in ambush. And the Deacon will try to net himself a prize. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tuohy, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Ire by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching Mad Max Minute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMinute. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld Episode 51. We'll see you next time.